Jewish Channel's Week in Review. Basketball and bonfires, the brightest stars in theater, the multimedia of Jewish women's history, and more of the Jewish news that's changing your world right now in this episode of the Week in Review. Hello, and welcome to the Jewish Channel's Week in Review. I'm Stephen I. Weiss. The big story in Israel this week is a basketball game. Maccabi Tel Aviv won the EuroLeague Basketball Championship Sunday night in an overtime victory against Real Madrid. It's a championship few expected to land in Israel with a series of upsets providing the path to victory. Maccabi last won the title back in 2005. Maccabi has now won six EuroLeague titles. Even Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was shown getting in on the act, watching the game himself. Of course, it wouldn't be a major event in Israel if it weren't marked by religious strife. Several ultra-Orthodox members of Knesset spoke out against those celebrating Maccabi's championship. Member of Knesset Rabbi Moshe Gaffney of the United Torah Judaism Party declared, We have become a country of idiots who do not respect the Torah. That's what Israelis care about? A game for children in third grade? Nisim Ze'ev of the Shas Party told the Jerusalem Post that sports had become Israel's, quote, golden calf, adding, quote, they made basketball and soccer a symbol of national pride instead of our rich Jewish culture. The team is imported from around the world. They are not Jews, but Israelis don't care as long as they win. For the religious Zionist Zvulun Kalfa of the pro-settler Bayit Yehudi party, the criticism almost seemed anti-Semitic. The Israeli reaction to the game is a symptom of a larger problem, Kalfa said, adding, We used to be more proud of our values and who we are. Now we use technical means of getting ahead like buying players with money. But while sports championship celebrations have often been marred by vandalism and public fires, in Israel the public fires were already done Saturday night for the holiday of Lagba Omer, which traditionally includes a bonfire celebration. Of course, with public bonfires all over the country, one finds people doing all manner of things with those flames. For one ultra-Orthodox rabbi, a public burning of smartphones and tablets was the best way to celebrate the holiday. This rabbi was asking volunteers to surrender their smart devices, tossing them into the fire. He is here touting the fact that a 15-year-old offered up his iPad. But if one's looking for a symbol of secularism to burn, one could go with an effigy of a government minister. And that was the approach of this group of ultra-Orthodox Jews, burning an effigy of finance minister Yair Lapid. But the most notorious fire is likely the one set by a group of West Bank settlers near Hebron, who took their bonfire into a Palestinian olive grove, illegally trespassing and burning Palestinian flags on the private property of a Palestinian family, while Israeli police and military looked on. But a different kind of theatrics was taking place here in the U.S., where the Drama Desk Awards nominees were out and about for a meet and greet, as Meredith Gansman reported. The Drama Desk Awards are one of the most prestigious honors in New York theater. And in case you're like me and have never been nominated for such an award, I'll let those who have tell you exactly how it feels. I'd like it uh, every morning, like cereal for breakfast. Yay! You're looking at a 39-year-old guy, but you're looking at a 17-year-old kid going, I can't believe I made it! It is. It's that extra little j**, you know? The biggest challenge is actually Shalom Chaverim! It was an early morning for New York's theater community at the official awards meet and greet, but that didn't stop the excitement as this year's class of nominees from Brian Cranston to Tony Collette woke up to meet the press. Michael C. Hall of Television's Dexter returned to Broadway this season with Will Eno's The Realistic Joneses. He and his fellow castmates Tony Collette, Tracy Letts, and Marissa Tomei received a special award for the best ensemble. So it's nice to have that pressure off. If I were you, I'd be walking in here today with a sign that says like winner and rubbing it in. Just, I'm wearing a t-shirt under this one that says it, but I was told that I needed the button down. Film funny man Chris O'Dowd, nominated for Best Actor in a Play for his role as Lenny in the Broadway revival of Of Mice and Men, sported an injured hand, which I suggested would garner some sympathy votes. That's what I'm going for. All joking aside, O'Dowd said he's most relieved that the transition from screen to stage was a smooth one. I was just hoping to not be the weak link in the play, so the, the fact that things have kind of gone well has been 
surprising but delightful. Tony Award winning Adina Menzel is back on Broadway for the first time in almost 10 years. It feels really good to be back surrounded by New York theater people. They're the best in the world. Menzel made her name originating roles in the blockbuster Broadway hits Rent and Wicked, the musical for which she won a Tony Award. Nominated this year for Best Actress in a New Musical, if then, she's committed to the development of new material for Broadway. I love being involved years in advance with the composers and the writers and um, that incremental process of making something really beautiful. Beautiful, the Carol King musical's leading lady can't believe she gets to play one of the most famous women in Jewish music history. And a little like Lutheran Midwestern girl gets to play her, but what an honor. Her positivity and her joy and the way she's in, maintained her integrity as an artist. It's a great, um, it's a great model, I feel. Mueller researched King's life and work extensively, but Danny Burstein, nominated for Best Supporting Actor in a Musical for his role in Cabaret, said doing research nearly impeded his performance. The show takes place in 1929 into 1930, and the Nazis don't take power until 1933 in, in uh, Germany. And so I couldn't know all that was about to happen. For more from this year's Drama Desk nominees, tune into the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. Thank you, Meredith. Another arts organization is celebrating 25 years with its leader. Christian Neaton has that story. The streets of New York City have been brightened up with urban art like this, created by the city's youth for the past 25 years, thanks to the public arts nonprofit City Arts and its Jewish executive and creative director, Zippy Benheim. The Jewish Channel spoke with Ben Haim, who was originally from Israel, about her 25-year tenure, which has seen over 200 public art projects around the city, and what motivates her. My mission is to give voice to our children and to our youth, to give them an opportunity to speak up. And what is a better way than speak up through the visual language? City Arts has helped New York's youth speak through a variety of mediums, that are meant to grab the attention of residents and visitors to the country's media capital. Whether it's painting or mosaic or sculpture or, or uh, a caricature or a drawing, uh, it's a visual language that speaks very fast. It has this energy of it reaches you right away, um, but it reaches you even more if the kids are able to create public art murals and mosaic and sculpture in their schools and in their communities. And these murals are permanent. They stay there and they become constant reminders, daily reminders, that what they did is very important for it impacts, it transforms the community completely, completely. Benheim has helped transform city arts over the past quarter century through a savvy fundraising and awareness raising approach that has resulted in partnership with 1,500 sponsors, including high profile supporters commemorated on a wall of photos in her office. But she recalled taking over a much different endowment situation in 1989. City Arts was uh, under the red, uh, and therefore there wasn't any board or staff. Uh, they gave me a chance and they said if you want to start or restart City Arts, um, do it on your own time with your own money. So uh, Ziggy, my husband, was my uh, first donor and supporter. And in fact, when my son was three years old, Yori, uh, he came into the office um, and gave me a dollar and he said, Mom, I'm contributing to your cause. New York City also lent a hand when a city-sponsored program presented Ben Heim with the opportunity to ask for project funds. To hear more from Zippy Ben Heim about her 25 years at City Arts, please tune into the full broadcast edition of the Week in Review. Thank you, Christian. Another anniversary, 18 years of the Jewish Women's Archive, was the focus of its recent gathering, and Rebecca Honig Friedman was there. As MC of the recent 18th anniversary celebration of the Jewish Women's Archive, held at the Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York, comedian Judy Gold had a confession to make. I am a troublemaker, as I think every woman here or every great woman who has ever done anything 
is a troublemaker. And to this audience, that's not a bad thing to be. Someone who's a troublemaker in our eyes is someone to be proud of. A troublemaker is somebody who does not accept the status quo and is not only willing to put herself on the line, uh, but is willing to deal with the repercussions. It's a watershed moment for the Jewish Women's Archive, the organization that's cast the designation of troublemaker into a badge of honor. On this 18th anniversary celebration, they're saying goodbye to founding director Gail Reamer and looking forward to a new chapter. For 18 years, the Jewish Women's Archive, or JWA, one of the first exclusively digital online archives, has been documenting and sharing the stories of Jewish women who, in ways large and small, have changed the course of history. In other words, of women who've made trouble. And at the helm has been founding director Gail Reamer. Gail built an organization that was unheard of. Really, it was radical at the time. She saw what the need was, and in doing this, she has given voice to countless other women and enriched our entire community. But what exactly was that need? The morning after the benefit, I sat down with Reamer, who was an academic before she became director of a nonprofit, to find out what motivated her to start the archive in the first place, and what it's like to leave it in someone else's hands. Reamer said the idea for JWA began when she joined the board of her daughter's Jewish day school. At Jewish events, and now we're talking in the 90, 1990s, um, it was still all men on every panel I saw. And when people gave talks, the only, the only people they referenced were men. It was as if women didn't exist. We really needed to change things. Schiffer Bronznik, the founder of Advancing Women Professionals and the Jewish Community, said JWA and other women's organizations have changed people's perspective on gender. When they see any public activities, conversations, exhibitions, publications, without the voices and vision of women, they consider it completely un unacceptable. But now, Reamer said, it's time for someone else to continue her work. Uh, there are younger people with new ideas, with new energy, with um, new ways of thinking about media and new ways of thinking about the uses of technology. Uh, we want to stay at the forefront. We have been able to stay at the forefront, but I think it's going to take the next generation to keep it at the forefront. To find out about Reamer's successor as director of the Jewish Women's Archive, watch the full broadcast version of the Week in Review. Thank you, Rebecca. Finally this week, caring for the sick is a core Jewish value going all the way back to the stories of Abraham in the Bible. In this week's episode of Up Close, Letty Cotton Pogerbin discusses her book, How to Be a Friend to a Friend Who's Sick. But a specific illness that's hard to see is mental illness. Large portions of American society are living with mental disorders like depression and anxiety. For a man at one of the more prominent posts in the world of journalism, his anxiety has long been a secret. But in his new book, Atlantic editor Scott Stossel reveals what anxiety has wrought in his life. Here are some of the highlights from my interview with Scott Stossel. You're editor of The Atlantic. You've got a job that uh, probably well more than half the journalism industry would trade you know, trade with you in a second. You've got a wife and two children. You live in Washington, D.C. You've had a very successful life. Uh, but what you reveal in this book is that all the time you were developing uh, this life, you were beset by seemed a crippling anxiety. Yeah, I mean, I, I got very good at, uh, and, and this is true of many people who have certain types of anxiety disorders, but I was very good at hiding it. And I, and I hadn't realized how good I was at hiding it until I actually came out with the book because, um, you know, I was my my friends and uh, my, my very close friends and my family and various therapists knew about this, and I always assumed that I had betrayed some evidence of uh, my anxiety uh, to my colleagues. But while they they thought I was sort of eccentric and weird, they, I was eccentric and weird in a way different from the way they that the, the, that they thought I was. It's interesting to see uh, someone uh, again if from a prestigious place uh, who hasn't revealed anything about himself to put out a book out there where he repeatedly ref refers to himself as having mental illness. Yep. I wonder how, what has that meant for you? Um, good question and, 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 a, and a, a couple of thoughts. I mean I guess for starters like I was profoundly ambivalent. I talk about this in the book about whether you know after all these years of successfully hiding it um, you know now at age 44 sh you know what, what are the consequences of my as it were coming out as anxious. I can't put that back in the bottle now and say oh, I was just kidding. Um, 
Yeah, uh, it's, it's a whole book. Yeah. It's not, yeah. Uh, well, my, actually, my son, who's seven, one time said, uh, my, my daughter had given me this little worry doll that was supposed to, um, you know, cure me of my anxieties. And my son said, well, what if it works and you're not, and you're not anxious anymore and you're going to have to go into the bookstore and tell them to take it away because it's wrong? Um, but uh, Those are good problems. Yeah, that yeah. would be a good problem to have. Um, but, but, yeah, so I did worry about would this somehow compromise my ability to do my job. Um, um, honestly, I think if I didn't have, you know, w and, and I, in, my, in the book, I talk, I, I sort of recount my conversations that I had with my therapist, Dr. W, about, gee, should I really do this, you know? And he said, no, no, you know, doing this will, on, on the one hand, you know, do something very useful, which is so much, um, and th this is a common phenomenon that he talks about called impression management. And people who have various forms of mental illness, particularly anxiety, engage in what they call impression management, which is trying to, you, you, one of the things you fear most is being a, having your anxiety and vulnerability exposed. So you build this whole sort of house of cards, veneer of outward competence and confidence um, that's meant to hide the internal anxiety. So th this impression management is both kind of a symptom of the anxiety, but it's also a cause, because it's very exhausting, because you're always afraid that the house of cards will come tumbling down. So one effect, I suppose, of coming out as anxious is that I've already done what my worst case fear was, which was to say, I'm anxious. So if suddenly I were to appear to be anxious, well, it shouldn't surprise anyone. I've already admitted that it actually probably has reduced my, my um, level of anxiety. You can see the full episode of Up Close on the Jewish channel on cable. You can also listen to the full audio of Up Close as a podcast available on iTunes or in your favorite podcast player. That's all for this week from all of us here at the Jewish Channel. Be well. The Jewish Channel is available on cable. Time Warner Cable Channel 528, IO Optimum Channel 505, RCN Channel 268, Bright House Channel 330, Verizon Fios Channel 900, Cox Cable Channel 1, Frontier Communications, and on Comcast in the on-demand menu under Premium Channels. For more information, visit TJCTV.com.